All right. Well, let's get ready for the Word of God. You guys excited for the Word? It's going to be an exciting Word. We're actually going to a popular story, and it's found in the book of Jonah chapter 1. We're going to go to Jonah. And I wanted to talk about this, because here's the thing. In our church, all the men fish. That's why I love our church. And all the men here, we all have fish stories. And some of our fish stories are exaggerating. <laughs> some of our, fi our fish stories are completely inaccurate. And if Jonah were here today, he would have the greatest fish story ever. So as we go to the book of Jonah, chapter 1, I had another message planned out. As you guys know, it was supposed to be about how to survive a valley, but I might put that one away until the Lord tells me to preach that one because I was reading this this week for some reason and I believe it's for someone here today or online. Jonah chapter 1 verse 15. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked the people are. But Jonah got up and went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Hopa, where he found a ship leaving to Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help. They threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused this terrible storm. And when they did, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? He demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What's your nationality? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And the sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all this time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this is ter a terrible storm. It's all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. They cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. O oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. O oh Lord, you sent the storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked up Jonah, they threw the, into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once. I love what verse 16 says. I want to put it in. I'll just read it to you guys. It says that sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power. And they made a promise to vow to serve Him. It's amazing, isn't it? Let's pray. As we talk about this title, check your plug. You're like, what? Come on, say it with me. Check your plug. And ask your neighbor this question. Help me preach this. Hey, have you checked your plug lately? It will make sense in a few minutes. Let's pray. Father, bless this word. As fathers, we just gather together as a church family. I pray that you would use me to speak your word. And let the story of Jonah be applicable to our lives today, Lord. As many of us maybe go through storms that are unnecessary, could have been avoided. 
And Father, I pray that you would help us, like Jonah, to experience a calm sea, peace, knowing we're at the right place in your will, walking in obedience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat as we get into the Word of God today. As we get into this Word, I titled it, Check Your Plug. Verse 4, let's put up verse 4. Verse 4 is what stood out to me. Verse 4 said, The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. The storm was so bad that the Bible makes it clear that the ship was breaking apart. It was about to break apart, meaning it was about to fall apart and go under. But it didn't. It was about to, but it didn't. And can I tell you as your pastor, and I'll be honest with you, there is nothing more frightening than being in a boat that's about to go under. I don't know if you've ever been in that predicament. I have twice. But there is nothing more frightening than being in a boat that's about to go under. So let me tell you my experience when this happened to me. It was just about a month ago. It was in July when I was with my brother in the Keys and we decided to get the boat ready and we loaded it up with all everything we needed to have a good day and we, we just stocked it with plenty of bait and fishing rods and the cooler and everything was ready to go and Danny drove the truck, we backed up the boat into the ramp, we were all excited, everything was checked and as I got inside the boat, Danny lowered the boat off the ramp, he took off to park the truck, I was left in the middle of the marina and I was excited, I was about to turn on the engine, as I turned on the engine, knowing that we were going to have a great day of fishing, the weather was great, the fishing report said excellent, and I said, this is the day we are going to have an amazing day of fishing, and I quickly noticed there was a little bit too much water in the boat. And I knew that it rained the night before, but I said, you know, I don't think it rained that much. And, the more, and then I looked away for a minute, and as I looked again, the water line was going higher and higher. And I quickly noticed something. Danny, Danny, forgot to plug the boat. And some of you were here for that time. I know my in-laws were there, and Danny, my mom were there. And even my father-in-law looked at him, like, that's not normal. But Danny forgot to check the plug. In the excitement of everything, he forgot to check the plug. And I want to tell you something. This is the plug. This is the most important part of any boat. It doesn't matter if it's a yacht, a 20-footer, a 30-footer, a 14, a 10, a little dinghy, a raft, whatever you want to call it. The plug. Say it with me. The plug is the most important part. Come on, say it with me. The most important part of the boat. In fact, every time you do a checklist before you set out to sea, they say that the plug of the boat has to be prioritized. Above all things, prioritize the plug. Because did you know that the number one reason boats go under is because people fail to check the plug? In Miami, the most boats, all the boats that go under most of the time in Miami, is a failed plug check. Because in the excitement 
of packing everything that's important in the excitement of packing the rods, the cooler, the food, everything you need to have an exciting day. We get so caught up in everything that we fail to check the most important parts of the boat. And it may not seem like much, but when if you check the plug, it can save your life. And I remember as I saw that boat going under, I was not thinking about my fishing rods. I was not thinking about the cooler. I was not thinking about anything else. But the only thing that was on my mind was why didn't Danny check the plug? You see, because today, like that boat, I believe there are so many people whose lives are going under. I believe there are many people, even in the church, even today, that it feels like you're going under. It feels like your life is falling apart. It feels like you can't stay afloat much longer. And I'm not talking about a boat now. But I'm talking about families that are going under. I'm talking about parents that have no relationship with their children. I'm talking about children that grow up and don't want to even serve God or be stepped foot inside a church. I'm talking about families that don't even sit down together anymore. I'm talking about parents that have no idea what's happening in the lives of their children and families are just falling apart. I'm talking about marriages. And we celebrate anniversaries today. But it's rare to see 40, 45 years now. Amen? And it's so common. You know, you don't ask people anymore how long you've been married. You ask them how long you've been divorced. It's so common to ask that better. Because the majority of marriages today are close to a 60% divorce rate. And that's people among the church, self-profane Christians that are saying they love Jesus and serve Jesus. These are marriages that are falling apart. Divorce is on the rise. Infidelity is on the rise. Trust has become an issue. And marriages are filled with all types of problems that are just falling apart. I'm talking about how many people are going under emotionally. And it feels like you're going under with depression all the time, discouragement, self-harm, you feel worthless. All these emotions of fear and worry and criticism and anxiety and panic just plague you and you're going under all the time. And every time you try to cheer yourself up and every time you say it's going to be a good day and every time you try to smile, it feels like your thoughts take over and bring you under emotionally. You want to check out of life. You want to check out from people. And you're going under emotionally. You might smile. You might say, hey, I'm good. I'm fine. Praise God. But underneath it all, emotionally, you are falling apart and going under. Maybe financially, that's what your boat looks like. You're going under financially. You're racking up the debt. You're worried about the bills, the rent, everything you have to pay. You're not sure if you can make it. And financially, you're going under. Or maybe it's even spiritually. And you don't serve God like you used to. You don't pray like you used to. You're not the same anymore with God. You don't have that same joy of your salvation. You may come to church, but the church doesn't really get inside you anymore like it used to. You can't wait to get out of here. You're looking at your clock. You're thinking about lunch. You're thinking about Monday. You're thinking about all the things you have to do. That is a sign that you're going under spiritually. You're easily going into sin more. You're doing things you know that's wrong before God, but you don't even feel bad anymore because you don't even pray anymore. Anymore. You can't remember the last time you opened up the Bible and you felt the presence of God anymore. You can't remember the last time you sang a worship song and then you felt the words just pierce your heart with this emotion that made you feel like God was right in front of you. You're going down and you're going under, falling apart spiritually. 
You see, all of us can relate to a, a boat or something in our lives. That you're saying, God, it feels like I'm going under. It feels like everything's falling apart. And whether it's your family, whether it's your marriage, your emotions, your finances, your spiritual walk with God, so many people today, like Jonah, are going under. And we go under for many different ways. But the reason is the same. Let me say that one more time. We all go under for many, in many different ways. But the reason is all the same. You want to know why so many people go under? You want to know why families fall apart, why marriages don't last, why emotionally our emotions get the best of us? You want to know why everything in your life is falling apart? It's this reason, and this is the one reason only. No matter who you are, no matter how long you've been a Christian, or even if you're not a Christian, if you watch the news and you see someone whose lives falling apart, if you see someone whose lives are just going under, the reason is the same. Here it is. We treat God like a boat plug. You know that God is the most vital part in keeping your life afloat. God will keep you afloat. God will keep me afloat. God will keep this church afloat. God keeps everything afloat. The problem is, how is it that the most important part of the boat gets neglected? Because even though it's the most vital part of any boat, we get distracted. We don't prioritize it. And it's not the first thing we check. You check with your emotions first. You check with other people first. You check with pleasure first. You check with what feels right to you. But so many people are falling apart because they fail to check with God. They don't prioritize God in their life. He might be something you do on a Sunday, but He's not something you live in your life. And the Bible is clear that Colossians 1.17 says this, He is before all things, and in Him all things what? Hold together. In Him all things. Say that with me. All Things, everything in your life, all things. There is not one area in your life that God does not want to be a part of. He is before all things, and all things hold together in Him. In fact, John 15, 5, Jesus put it this way. He said, yes, I am the vine, you are the branch. Those who remain in me, I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. nothing. Being apart from God means nothing. That word nothing in the Greek literally means useless. You want to have a useless life, feel in your heart you can live a life apart from Jesus. You say, oh, I can do it on my own. I can live my life however I want. And you will quickly see that apart from God, you will fail. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. God says, I hold all things together. God is the most important aspect of your life. He is the thing that keeps you afloat. Nothing else matters because if you have no plug, everything else goes under. But yet we still prioritize everything else above God. And God says, I hold all things how can something so important, something so vital and necessary be so neglected? 
because we get distracted. Like that day, I was distracted by my fishing rods, the bait, everything else. And I didn't even prioritize the most important part of the boat. And I wonder for you what it is that the devil has to distract you with where you no longer prioritize God anymore. And you fail to check where your heart is with God. And yet when you see the water line rising, you see everything going under, then you remember, oh man, maybe it's because I fell apart from God. Maybe it's because I wandered from the truth. Maybe it's because I'm living in sin. Maybe it's because I wandered from God and I'm living my own life. But it's only when we are going under that we realize we failed to check with God. And at that moment, when everything in your life is going under, everything that we get distracted with can't help you. We fail to check with God because our jobs get in the way. And we say, well, I just got to work too much. And all you think about is working that you don't even prioritize God anymore. Maybe it's money and money is the reason you're distracted and money is all you think about because you need more money. That's why you work so much because, well, you need money. I have to pay bills. I got to make rent. I got to buy clothes. The kids need, need, need this and you that. I have so much things. Everything's getting higher and higher. I got to pay and money and money and money is all you think about. Maybe you're distracted by relationships and friendships and girlfriends and boyfriends and all the people around you or all these things that become more important than God. It's the money. It's the job. It's the relationship it's the education it's the pleasure it's everything we feel is important at the moment but see I will tell you from experience that when your boat is going under nothing else matter than getting that boat back afloat with the plug yes so many people we kind of leave God aside and God is no longer vital. And I started thinking about 13 years of being a pastor here. And you know what saddens me? I've seen more people go under than being raised. I've seen more people walk away from God. I've seen more friends of mine wander away from the truth, living a life in the world now. And it seems like every day more and more people are just choosing not to live a life to honor God and just living out there in the world. Living for things that aren't going to matter when your whole life goes under. But we fail to check what's really the most important aspect of my life. And I started wondering this week, why is it so many people go under? And as I read Jonah, I realized three things in the story of Jonah that show us why so many people go under. Would you care to know what they are? Number one, let's look at verse three. Verse three. Remember, God told Jonah, a man of God, a prophet who preached on behalf of God, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach. But Jonah, now the Bible says that God said to Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh. And here's the thing about Jonah. Jonah got up, but he went opposite direction. Now let me explain something to you. This is called partial obedience because God told him, get up. Church, did Jonah get up? Yes, he got up. But did he go where God wanted him to go? No. So you say, well, God, I am obedient. I am doing it God's way. No. Partial obedience to God is still disobedience. There's no halfway with God. Because a lot of people think that they do meet God halfway. And they do it halfway. And okay, God, I'll do this, but I'm not going to do that. Or maybe I'll do that, but I'm not going to do this. You are in direct violation of God's word. This is called disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. 
obedience. Can I get an amen? Because we live in a world that tries to sugarcoat it and say, well, at least I'm doing some of it. At least I'm better. At least I'm trying. No, you are disobedient. Let's call it what it is. Jonah, get up. Okay, I can do that. I like that. But here's the thing about serving God. Some things you're going to like, some things you don't. Oh, don't look at me like I'm the only one. <laughs> Have you read this book lately? There's a part here that says love your enemy. You're like, eh, I don't like that. But there's another part that says if you do this, God will advance you and bless you and, and, and give you an abundance. Ooh, I like that. God says you got to do both. You know what our problem is in the church? We want to do the things we can do. The things we like. The things that's easy. Jonah, get up. I can do that. Jonah, go preach to these people you feel don't deserve love. Uh, no. Did God ever ask us to pick and choose where to obey? But here's Jonah's first problem and why so many people go under. We meet God halfway. For some of you, I will obey God. This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to church. You're halfway there. What's going to happen after 1230 or so? Lunch? Then what? Who knows? But you're meeting God halfway. You might obey Him all the way. You might not. It depends if I like it or not. You might have a waiter or a waitress that's rude to you and God's going to tell you, please, still tip them. Be a good example. You're going to go, no, it happened to me yesterday. I didn't want to tip our server. He was horrible. And Jericho has been hanging out with mom and she's like, you got to do what's right. And I'm like, who are you? You're supposed to be on my side. Oh, we hit the one year mark. That's it. It's going under. Listen, it happens. Jonah met God halfway. I'll get up. But I'm not going to Nineveh. So he made a choice. He went the opposite direction. I want to make it simple for our church. Living opposite to God's word never works. Never. Never. But Jonah made a choice. I know what you said, God. But I'm going to do the opposite. And you know what frightens me? God let him do it. God doesn't stop us because we have free will. And free will means God will tell you what to do, but you have the choice to do it or not. In fact, I want to show you this map to show you what Jonah did. There's Nineveh. He went completely straight opposite to Tarsus. It's a straight line. But here's what I want you to understand. With God... There's a straight line. God doesn't play games with us. God says, this is right, this is wrong. Are we straight? But the world and the church says, no, I think like this. I think like that. I don't look like I'm doing the, you know, thing, but God says, straight line. It's a straight line, yes or no, wrong or right. Sin or not. But today we say, oh, this is kind of grayish. This, we're not sure about, no, God says it's a straight line. I am who I am. That's who I am. God says it's a straight line. It's wrong. But see, many of us say, oh, I know it's a straight line, but notice what Jonah did. He went out of line. It was a straight line to Nineveh, but he went first down where? To Hopa. He went down to Hopa. And I realized how the devil works. God gave him a straight direction. 
But you notice that Hopa, well, that's where Jonah had to go down to to get far from God. Can I tell you, church, if you would have told Jonah before this event that he would have chosen to go the furthest away from God as possible, Jonah would have told you, I would never do that. I serve God. I'm a man of God. I love God. And many people seem to think they are so spiritual, they will never be far from the Lord. But believe me, it could happen. In fact, many people get far from God as far as they never thought possible. How does it happen? How does a believer end up so far from the Lord? There's always a Joppa. Did you know that the word Joppa is a Hebrew verb? And the Hebrew verb for Joppa is Joppa. And Joppa literally means to shine beautiful. And here's what's interesting how the devil works. In order for the devil to get you as far as he can from God, he puts something in your path that shines beautiful first. And every storm you go through at one point started off beautiful, started off radiant. In fact, the devil knows this because the devil, Lucifer, literally means light. He shines. He's very beautiful. He was the most beautiful angel in heaven. So he knows that out of beautiful things can come chaos. And you see what the devil does? In order to get you far away from God, he has to put something in your life that looks harmless, that looks beautiful, that doesn't seem bad, it doesn't seem that it shines. And he had to go down to hope of first. And he bought a one-way ticket away from God. And I see a lot of people making that purchase lately, don't you? A lot of people are paying that one-way ticket away from God, headed towards the storm, and all the devil does is to put something beautiful in front of you. And here's the thing. God let him do it. God said, you, you know it's wrong, but you think it's beautiful. I know it's shiny and nice, but you know it's wrong, but you're going to do it anyway. And he bought the ticket. And I wish the Bible says, and instantly the storm came. It's not what it says. Jonah was asleep. Smooth sailing. Because there's a point in your life that sin looks smooth. It starts off beautiful, it goes smooth for a while. Then the storm hits. The devil just puts something in beautiful in front of you that's going to lead you to the storm of your life. It starts off easy, smooth. A little lunch with the opposite sex. It's just a little text message. It's just one website, one channel, one date. But Lord, you look so beautiful. Everything that shines is not always gold. And Jonah had smooth sailing for a while. See why so many people go under? It's because they choose the beautiful things over God. And before you know it, you're further away from God than you ever imagined. And behind every person that is far from God, I believe there was a Joppa. Something or someone the devil put in front of you that looked beautiful. Number two, Verse 10. How do people go under? The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. Number two. I'm going to get a lot of you with this one. You ready? 
Here's a question. What's that person doing on your boat? Wrong people. Wrong people. Here's what's crazy about verse 10. Here's a context that a lot of us fail to see. While in Joppa, on the port, the sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them what? He was running away from God. You know what's crazy about these sailors? Let's, let's put Jonah aside. Let's talk about these sailors. They knew Jonah was wrong. They knew Jonah was running away from God. They knew he wasn't right with the Lord. And yet when Jonah presented them the money, they said, right away, in you go. Can I tell you something? Let's just not... Let's, let's, you know the people that don't belong in your life. Amen. Let's just clap. Let's say amen. I know it, Pastor. I know the people that don't belong in my life. They knew it. But they ignored the warning. And they let him in. And that's what happens in Joppa. The warning signs are all there. He's not the one. Oh, but he's so cute. <laughs> she ain't it for you, but she's so hot. Hey, girl, come aboard. The warning signs were there. And many people go under because we choose Again, what is beautiful over God. And we ignore the warning signs. And nothing will take you under quicker than the wrong person in your life. It's a person you shouldn't even be friends with. I right, but let me send them a friend request anyway. Just to see how they're doing. It's a person you see their profile. You know you can't swipe. But you read the profile and it's all Joppa. Wow, that is nice. That is shining. Look how radiant. Uh, I'm sorry, Lord. It's people you know. You should never have married. But you are desperate. You are scared. And now you wish you were single. It's people you know you shouldn't have lunch with. Oh, but they're my co-workers. Oh, but it's just a friend. You know the warning signs are there. It's a person you know you shouldn't text. Or when they text you, you know what to do. Block! But you like it. And you ignore the warning signs. God says bad company corrupts good morals. But see what we do? Can I show you what we do? I'm not lying. Here's a mistake we make. Verse 7 through 8. Remember, they knew the warning signs were there. This man told them, oh, I'm running away from God, but here I have the money. Oh, right this way. Look at verse 7 and 8. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them offended the gods and caused a terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. So let's pause for a minute. God let them know, he's the reason you're in this mess. They know why they're in that mess. They know why everything's falling apart. They know why they're miserable. They know why they're in the storm. God's like, ah, there he is. You let him in. The warning signs were there. You chose not to let, you chose not to listen. You ignored the warning. You let him in. Now you're in the storm. That's the reason. Why is this all for storm coming down on us? Oh, come on. You know why you're in this mess. I don't know why. My life is so hard. I don't know why I'm so far from God. I don't know why I act this way. I don't know why I curse this way. I don't know why I have this attitude. You know why. God says, it's them. But you like them. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded. And now look at what they did. Who are you? 
What's your line of work? What country are you from? What's your nationality? Shouldn't they have asked that at port? They're asking the right questions only after. Can we say wrong timing? Why is it that we wait to be divorced to say, I don't think they were the one? <laughs> why is it that you're making child support payments? Like, I don't know why. I, felt, I, knew, I knew in my heart he was crazy. <laughs> why is it only after we're under that we say, hey, who are you really? Are these not the dumbest sailors ever? Are we not that dumb? No? They were asking all the right questions at the worst time. If someone beautiful comes into your life, start asking questions. Where are you with God? Don't even ask them, watch them. Because you know what? When you meet that person, ooh, they're going to look beautiful. I go to church every Sunday. But before that person, I've never seen you a day in my life but Christmas. Start finding out. But look at what happened. God warned them. He's the reason. They knew he was wrong. Verse 11 through 13. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop the storm? And remember, he speaks on behalf of God. So this was God telling these sailors, throw him into the sea. You know what God said? Dump him. <laughs> Dump him. Hey, God, no, listen. God, what should I do? Dump him. What did I hear right? Overboard. <laughs> but Lord, that's so cruel. But Lord, how can I do that? Trust me. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Unfriend them. Change your number. Break up. Move. I don't know what you have to do. Practice. Come on, let's all practice. Because it's not worth it. It's not worth losing your boat over a man. Or a girl. She's crazy. What are you doing with her? Sorry, baby. I love you. Got to go. Why? I'm serving God now. But what about them? God had a fish for Jonah. He was taking care of him. You're not God. Let God deal with them. Say it with me. Overboard! Overboard. That's it. Throw him into the sea. Jonah said, and it will become calm again. You want peace? Come on. Overboard. It will become calm again. I know that this is a terrible storm. It's all my fault. Look at verse 13. Instead, the dumb sailors rode even harder to get the ship to land. No, I'm going to save him. I'm going to convert him. I know that Jesus is going to change his heart. I know he's going to serve God. I feel he might be a pastor one day, pastor. I think he might work for you, pastor. I know I'm going to try my best to change him. You cannot change people. God changes people. But here we are rowing. Listen, you are rowing with people you shouldn't be rowing with. But they try to get him saved. Isn't that what we do? We know the warning signs, we ignore it. We know God says, throw him overboard, we ignore it. We know God is saying, this is the reason you're in the storm. If you want peace, get rid of them. No, I'm going to keep them. And God let them. Okay, you keep rowing. You're just going to get tired. The storm's only going to get worse. And you're going to lose more than you have to. 
Because the Bible says they lost cargo. Listen, they lost precious cargo that should never have been lost had they never allowed Jonah in that boat. And I don't know who I'm preaching to because I'm about to go on the boat myself. But if you keep them in your life, God says you're going to lose things you never had to lose. But buy it through gold. Keep rowing. Keep rowing with them. Keep rowing. Number three. They lived opposite to God. Wrong person in the boat. Verse five. Fiend for their lives. Now they're afraid for their lives. The desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten up the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hole. You know what gets me angry? Jonah was at fault, yet he was living like it didn't matter. Because there are people you've allowed into your lives that are making your lives a mess, but when you look at them, they're fine. You're the one that's messed up. Why? Because you keep rowing with people you don't need to be rowing with. And now they're desperate. And the sailors are praying to other gods. And all this time, Jonah was asleep on the boat. Here's what's interesting and why many of us go under. We try to fix our lives by our own effort. They started praying to their other gods, thinking that that's going to help them stay afloat. They started throwing cargo overboard. They started saying, okay, I know what's wrong. I know I need to throw Jonah overboard, but let's not do what God says. Let's just do this other thing. And you're trying to fix your life away from the word of God. It doesn't work. And so many people are going under, and yet like these sailors, we run to our other gods. We think money's going to help. That's my God. So I know money can get me out of this. But what do you do when you think money is the answer, but money doesn't save you? You think people are going to help you. But what do you do when those people can't save you? You think pleasure and drugs and alcohol and the world's going to save you. But what happens when pleasure doesn't save you? What do you do when you do it on your own and your own effort and you're still going under? Under. The Bible said it only got worse. And maybe that's you today. You're saying, I know what's wrong in my life. I know what I have to stop doing. I know the sin that I'm in. I know. But Pastor, it just feels like I know the right thing I have to do, but I just don't want to do it. And God still let them. You go ahead. Lighten up the boat. Go pray to your gods. But when nothing works, let's see if you're going to listen to me. Let me close with verse 14. Why do so many people go under? We live opposite to God. Knowing the straight line, knowing that the right thing that we need to do, yet we choose what is beautiful over God. We let the wrong people influence our lives. And rather than getting them overboard, we get our rows and start rowing with them. But nothing changes. And then you run off and say, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to make my own effort to get my life right. And what breaks my heart is that these men pray to gods that weren't real. Gods that couldn't save them. And so many people, we are running to other gods that aren't going to do a thing for you. That only got worse. It didn't work. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, Then they cried out, to the Lord. Jonah's God. It didn't even say their God because they didn't even know God, but they cried out to him anyway. Oh Lord, they pleaded, 
don't make us die for this man's sin. And don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. What I love about God, he answered their prayer. They didn't know God. They never worshiped God. They never served God. But when they cried out to that God, they did not know that God answered them. Is that not the greatest picture of mercy and grace? When you cry out to God, it doesn't matter how far you've been, even if you don't know Him, if you cry out to Jesus today, He'll hear you. Even after they ignored the warnings, even though after they let Jonah in, even though after they ran to other gods, when they knew nothing was working, something in them said, will you listen to God now? And these men got together and cried out to God. And in verse 15 through 16, the sailors, they picked up Jonah because all of us have a Jonah in our lives. Something that doesn't belong. Amen? The sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea. And the storm stopped at once. And the Bible says these men were amazed at the power of God and they vowed to serve him. Church, do you want to be amazed and experience the power of God in your life? Then do what he says. Stop living opposite to the word of God. Stop allowing the wrong people to influence you. You know the things in your life like Jonah that do not belong. And you know it is not worth losing things you know you cannot lose. You have to Throw them and surrender them to God. And when you cry out to God, we have a God that says to these sailors, I know you haven't served me. I know you don't know me. I know, but I want you to know me. And God sent this storm. And even though it was horrific, even though it was terrible, that storm was what led them to God. And that is why God doesn't let things in your life work out because it leads you to Him. When the money doesn't work and the drugs don't work and the women don't work and the pleasures don't work and the beating your own effort doesn't work, that's when God says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So many sailors out here that are trying to do it without God. But don't treat God like a boat plug. God holds everything together. Your life, your destiny, your tomorrow, your eternity, your family, your kids, your marriage, your finances, your health, your job, everything in your life, everything around you, everything you have now, everything you will have, everything in your life, every detail, every inch of you, everything God holds. So why would we ever Look at this God and belittle Him. Why would we ever look at God like I'm looking at this plug and think other things matter? And this is why so many of us go under. Because we think we can do it without God. And today, maybe for the first time like these sailors, you need to cry out to Jesus. Oh, well, pastor, I haven't been in church. I don't know God. I'm so much of a sinner. Exactly. That's why you need Jesus. And these men didn't know God, but when they cried out to him, God answered. Or maybe I have a Jonah in the church. You know God, 
You serve God. You love God. But the devil has you at Joppa. And there are all these beautiful things he's dangling in front of you that you know are getting you further away from God. And maybe like Jonah, you're further than you ever imagined. And it was inside the belly of the fish that Jonah repented for living opposite to God. And the fish spit him out and got him right back on track. Isn't God good? So maybe you need to come to the Lord for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time, like Jonah, you need to repent of living opposite to God, realizing you have failed to check the plug. But pastor, what do I do? Let me make it easy for you. Look at the word plug with me. The word plug. Stay with me. Plug. I believe God told me this this morning. It stands for this. Ready? Prioritize life under God. You want to know why you're under? Prioritize life under God. You want to check your plug? Ask yourself if this is the way you're living. Are you prioritizing your life under God? Or are you prioritizing your life under your emotions, under money, under your children, under your spouse, under your friends, under the world, under pleasure, under sin? Can you answer this honest to God question? Is your life prioritized under God Almighty. Check your plug. If not, repent. Turn. You might be the sailor. I don't know God, but I know I need Him. Because my other gods aren't working. Cry out to Jesus today. He'll save you. Or maybe I got Jonah's. And you're further from God more than you ever imagined. Because you bought the lie of Joppa. A one-way ticket away from God always leads you to a storm. And that storm is not a punishment. That storm is grace. It is God saying, it's not working out because I'm calling you back to me. Say it with me. Check your plug. Let's all bow our heads. Let's all stand to our feet today. If you're here today, church, check your plug. Look at your life right now. Is it prioritized under God? Because the Bible says if you humble yourself before the, under the hand of God, if you humble yourself under the hand of God, He will lift you up. Isn't it interesting? He says, you need to get under me for me to raise you up. So in order for God to get you from being under back up again, you need to get under God. So the reason you're going under is because you're not under God. And if you want God to raise you up again and keep you afloat again, humble yourself and realize you need Him. Humble yourself and realize in your own effort you can't save yourself. You can't save your life. You can't change your future. You can't change your marriage. You can't change the outcome of the storm. God controls all things because He's the plug. So I want to pray to the sailors today and the Jonas. Allow me to pray for the sailors today. If you're here today and you're saying, I don't know Jesus. I don't know about him. But I know I need him. You see, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and for mine. 
And He did that so that you would have a relationship with Him, so that you would know Him. And right now you're in this church, you're listening online because like the sailors, you've tried all the other gods, but they have left you abandoned in the storm because there is no other God. There is only God Almighty in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how far you are. It doesn't matter how wicked you think you are. If you call on the name of Jesus like these sailors did, you will be saved. So if that's you today, would you put that hand up and say, Pastor, this is me. God bless you. I see your hand there today. I see you today. Amen. Maybe today I have Jonah's in the house. You're saying, oh God, I know I know you. You saved me. I know that I serve you. I know that I am saved. But Lord, I'm Jonah. I live with partial obedience. I live opposite to you. I'm far from God. You're saying, Pastor, I'm farther than God. I am further than I ever imagined. And I don't know how I got this far. I do. It started in Joppa. Something the devil put in front of you that looked innocent, looked beautiful. They looked okay. You let them in your boat. And now the storm has hit you. You know you're not right with God. You know you're far from the Lord. That's why you have no peace. You have no calm. Because the Lord is calling you to repent of your wayward spirit. Repent from running from God. And run back to Him. Jonah prayed, Lord, forgive me. I repent. And just like that, the fish spit him right back on track. That is the opportunity God has for you today. If you're here today, you're saying, Pastor, I'm a Jonah. Would you put that hand up? Where my Jonah's at? God bless you. I see your hand there. I see yours there. Yours. Let's all pray together today. And check your plug. Prioritize your life under God. And don't treat him like a boat plug anymore. Prioritize him first. Do not belittle him because he holds all things together. So I want to pray for those today that for the first time they want to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Would you pray this with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, Lord, I want to know you. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for the way I've lived my life away from you. And today I cry out to you for salvation. I confess that you are Lord. And apart from you, Lord, I am nothing. Save me, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. And if you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I'm a Jonah. I'm far from the Lord. Right now, would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus. I'm far from you. This is my Jonah. You tell him what it is. What is it? Is it a thing? Is it a person? Is it something you're doing that's keeping you away from God? But Lord, today I'm checking my plug. And I realize I'm going under because I have not prioritized you. Forgive me, Lord. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for all the sailors and all the Jonas in church today and listening online. And I pray for the people that are far from you, Lord. I pray for those right now that feel they can't be forgiven. Let them know, Lord, upon crying out to you in repentance, you will save them and bring them peace again. 
And I pray for courage, Lord, for those who know the Jonas they need to throw overboard today. The things that are hindering them. Forgive us for rowing with people we know we shouldn't row with. Forgive us, Lord, for living opposite to your word, thinking we can get away with it. Forgive us, Lord, for going and running to other gods in our own effort to fix things only you can fix. And we humble ourselves before you, prioritizing you above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Will you give God some praise today? Come on, everyone, check your plug, amen? Say that with me one more time. Check your plug.